Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. One of the key aspects of the Stoic view on the universe in general, and on human beings as well, fits into what they would call their physics, but what we would nowadays call philosophy of religion. And it's this doctrine of providence, or pronoia in, in the Greek. Now, the Stoics believed that there was a god with a capital G, you could say, Zeus, right? Um, but he was totally unlike what, what people have depicted in him as. He's not this old guy with a beard who goes around uh, impregnating all sorts of human women, getting his wife angry at him, etc., etc. Instead, God is the principle running throughout the entire universe. Um, you know, you might say the divine mind within everything, imminent, not, not uh, transcendent who is outside of the universe, but imminent within the universe. And God is, you know, hyper-rational, that is, he's rational to the fullest extent, beyond our capacities even to, to fully understand. He is wise, he is, you know, pick all these superlative terms that we can use. Um, you know, there were other discussions about where do the gods, uh, small g, fit in, and we're not going to worry too much about that because Epictetus doesn't really say that much about that. He thinks in terms of the divine hotheos, right, or Zeus. And before we go into the discussion about providence itself, let's look at the different positions that he lays out as live possibilities in chapter 12 of book 1. He says that there's five main ones. He thinks that there's good reason to assert that the fifth one is actually true. But he understands that different people throughout history, up to his point, and if he were around today, he would say this goes as well, have held different positions. And they've arrived at that because that seemed reasonable to them. So the first one is simply atheism. God doesn't exist. There is nothing divine. And so we don't have to think about this any further, whether there's divine providence or anything like that, because it's a non-starter. No God, no providence. And some of the you know, viewpoints on the Epicureans said, well, you Epicureans are basically atheists, but the Epicureans actually would fit into the second class. There were a few people who did say, well, there are no divine things. It's all just random you know, uh, events or you know, the universe itself. Um, not too many, uh, although you know, we find a lot in our own time. Uh, the next position was that the divine exists, or the gods exist, or whatever you want to call them, but they're inactive and indifferent. And this would indeed be the position of the Epicureans. The Epicureans said the gods exist, and uh, the reason why they're not involved with human beings is precisely because they're gods. They're smart enough to know that that would get them into all sorts of uh, troubles and, and give them problems to deal with, and they don't want that sort of you know, hassle. So they just live their blessed existence elsewhere. They're, they're sort of what we call a deus otiosis in Latin, a god who doesn't do anything, a lazy god, right? Um, there's, you know, the, the, the god of um, other viewpoints could fit in there, I suppose, but it's, you know, you might say, well, why have gods at all? Well, you know, there's just sort of concession to popular views, I suppose. It also gave them something to aim for. Now, uh, the third one is getting more and more interesting. God exists, or the gods exist, there is something divine, and it does take forethought, it's interested in something. But what's it interested in? Not in the stuff down here, but only in the great things that are happening in the heavens. We might say, you know, the, the um, 
deist conception of God that we see coming about later on in the Enlightenment uh, fits in with this. God takes some forethought, but only for the generalities that govern the, the universe. That's another, so that's another position. The fourth position is that God takes some forethought for general human matters. So God cares about things like, is the nation of Rome going to prosper or fail? And God might be interested in particular figures, like you know Julius Caesar, insofar as Julius Caesar and, and Pompey have some sort of stake in that, right? But um, God's not that worried about the little people, everybody, you know. Um, God is, is interested in the big picture. Um, we, you know, we might think of this as sort of like the God of Hegel in many respects, if, if, if we think about his views on the sweep of history and development. Um, but there were a lot of people who were asserting things like that at the time, that, you know, the gods, they exist, um, they're, but they're not necessarily interested in, you know, the very tiny minutia of what somebody is doing, you know, who's, who's not a, an important personage. Then we have the fifth position, and this is what the Stoics actually thought. This is what Epictetus thinks, that the divine takes forethought for all matters, particular as well as general down to, you know, the proverbial gospel sparrow. Um, this is, is, is similar to the other conceptions of God that we see floating around at the time, both in traditional pagan religion and coming on the scene in Judaism and Christianity. Um, and this is what Epictetus actually himself teaches as the orthodox Stoic viewpoint. So let's explore that viewpoint now. In chapter 6, he tells us the most about providence, but also in chapter 14, there's, there's quite a bit of important material as well. He says in chapter 6 that the universe and all the things in it are arranged providentially. Uh, and this, again, is, is you know, not something he's coming up with on his own. You can see this if you read Cicero's On the Nature of the Gods and look at the Stoics view. Uh, Epictetus is just you know, stressing it and, and reinterpreting it in very vivid terms. Epictetus thinks that the lesser things, like plants and animals, are not only you know, taken care of by, by God, God made them in such a way that they'll, say, reproduce, they'll you know, manage to keep themselves alive, they will do the sort of things that they're designed to do, but they're also uh, created and ordered for human existence. So you know, Epictetus thinks that... Um, the animals that we have, have been able to harness and turn to our own uses, that is because providence has arranged things in such a way that that would become possible for us. Now, human beings are a higher stage on the, you might say, the great ladder of being. And human beings uh, share something in common with the divine. We're going to talk about this more in another core concept video, specifically on human relations to the divine. Um, but the, the upshot of this is that animals are able to, as Epictetus says, use appearances. That is, they, they interact with their environment, right? So they, they see another um, animal of their own sort, and they feel a kind of fellow feeling towards it, unless perhaps it's mating season, in which case there might be a rivalry, or there could be a turf war, or, you know, one has to show dominance, or they're going to mate with each other, or, you know, however we go on. Um, you know, they see one of their own kind being attacked by another animal, perhaps they get involved in the fight. Um, there's all these things that, that go into them. They react to their environment in ways that are determinately ordered to that kind of animal. And there's, you know, we know nowadays that there's quite a bit of plasticity in this, uh, quite a bit more than the ancients perhaps were able to observe, but uh, Epictetus could account for that. that. That's not, you know, sort of a uh, major killer for his point of view. What's really important is that we human beings not only use, but understand. So we can take a position, a reflexive position, on our own use of appearances. This is what Stoic philosophy does in saying, hey, it's not the death itself that's terrible, it's your fear of death that is making death seem terrible to you. Um, that is a reflexive stance that's possible because we understand. And because we understand, there's also the possibility for misunderstanding, of, of going astray, 
Um, we are probably the, the most screwed up creature in the world from the perspective of, of philosophers because there are so many different ways in which unlike animals who tend to develop more, more or less instinctually, we can go off the rails in many ways and our cultures often gear us towards, towards making bad choices like that. But we are part of the providential order and we have a unique role in it. Epictetus goes on to say that not only do we act within the providential order, and not only are we there to be spectators of it, so that we can see it in a way that animals can't, we're there to uh, be part of the interpretation, the exegete, of the universe, of providence. We have uh, a role that elevates us, not to the status of gods, but um, which promotes us to become part of what Epictetus is going to call the divine commonwealth. Uh, when we're talking about Stoic cosmopolitanism, which I will talk about in another video, this is an important aspect to it. It's not just that all human beings are part of one big family or, or uh, oikonomike, uh, a vast you know, household or a sharing or something like that. It's that we're also doing that with what sets up and orders the universe. We have that capacity for, for uh, Epictetus. And we can interpret it in all these different ways. We can say, God is doing a terrible job. God is doing, you know, okay. God is doing a great job. I don't know why God only cares about the high and mighty and not us little people. You know, all of these are available possibilities for us precisely because of this, this faculty of, of uh, rationality that we possess. Now, Epictetus himself says that the proper response on the human being's part to the providential order is twofold. It's to, to try to adopt a systematic view, uh, this, the, you know, suno um, you know, what does that mean? It's, it's sort of like a seeing everything all connected, you know, looking at it from, from uh, on top, not just looking at it from our own individual uh, self-centered perspectives, but seeing ourselves as part of a larger whole. So he uses examples, uh, you know, like for example, the foot. Um, the foot, he says it's not in this, in this uh, particular chapter, but in other chapters. Um, the foot doesn't really like to get stuck in the mud. Understandably so, right? It's not a pleasant experience, unless you're, I guess, a mud fetishist. Uh, there's probably such a thing, I suppose, if you Google it. Um, but if it's what's good for the human being as a whole, then the foot can say, oh, well, that's, that's my job to walk through this mud so the other parts don't have to do this. Well, it's, it's the same with, with us human beings. Uh, it's very easy for us to adopt very self-centered perspectives and say, oh, the universe is screwed up. Um, you know, why me? Oh, God, why do you test me with all of this nonsense that you impose on me? And Epictetus says, well, you're just not taking a broad enough view. Um, as a matter of fact, God, he says this in there, God has given us the faculties to be able to respond to the sort of difficulties that we need to. You know, if you find yourself being jealous or envious, you have faculties to deal with that. You can reason with yourself and steer yourself towards a sort of uh, magnanimity uh, or, or, you know, uh, untroubledness with respect to that. If you find yourself um, suffering lust, you know, you, common experience in ancient times as well as our own, um, you have temperance that you can choose to incorporate into your life and follow and, and you'll be okay. You won't be necessarily drawn into it. Uh, if you go wrong, it's actually not so much God's fault as, as your own, he would say. The other thing that he thinks is very important is a sense of gratitude. Um, uh, Haris is, is a, a word that can be translated as grace uh, in the New Testament. Um, it's often translated as something like a, a you know, f uh, happy feeling, uh, elation, um, but it also means, um, you know, the, this, this back and forth of, of gratitude. And so El Christon is kind of making it even more intensive. And the idea is that when we look at how things are arranged, we ought to feel not only good because they're good for us, but we ought to feel a sense of, you know, goodness towards 
whatever has arranged things in this way. Um, a little bit later on in chapter 14, he's dealing with a very interesting question. How does God, in fact, uh, perceive this whole universe if, if indeed he or it does? Um, you know, if you're asserting that, that God takes care about everything, somehow God actually has to be overseeing things. So how does that happen? Um, he says, you know, he gives a long argument here, which I'm going to summarize a bit. You see how God, you know, has everything else doing what it's supposed to do? You know, the plants shoot forth in the spring, and they reproduce and all of that. Um, he says... Uh, are the plants in our own bodies so closely bound up with the universe, and do they so intimately share its affections? And is it not the same much more true of our own souls, our own personalities? If we want to say that the universe is arranged in such a way that there's a cosmic order to it, we ourselves are part of that cosmic order. Not only are our bodies, but our minds, our souls, our personalities. And so he goes on, and, you know, he says, look, those are more like God than, than those other things. He says, if our souls are so bound up with God and joined together with him as being parts and portions of his being, does God not perceive their every motion as being a motion of that which is his own and of one body with himself? And you have the power to think about the divine dispensation and about each several item among things divine and at the same time about human affairs. So do you think that God doesn't, doesn't have that? All this you do is God not able to oversee all things and to be present with all and to have a certain communication from them all? Um, another objection that gets made a little bit later is, well, I can't follow all these things at the same time. And Epictetus says, well, you're not God, right? I mean, why assume that you would be able to follow all these things? You're just a human being. He says, um, does anyone go so far as to tell you this, that you possess a faculty which is equal to that of Zeus? Um, so the idea there is that God would, uh, you know, we don't, we don't actually have to be able to explain in complete detail how it is that God is able to understand and take care for all things in part because we're one of those things that is part of that, that grand cosmic rational order. Um, so, long story short, Epictetus is a firm believer and a great advocate of divine providence, and he lays out how we ought to not only understand it, but how we ought to respond to it. 